Hi, I'm Zach Mashburn. And I'm Rodney Hedrick. We're the founders of Zach and Rodney Ministries. The stories that you're about to hear have forever changed the lives of the people who have lived them. Stories of near-death experiences, ongoing struggles, and tremendous loss. All of which represent the wounds of war and the high cost of freedom. We invite you to listen to the heart of American soldiers and their families as they talk about the tragic events that have left them fighting a different kind of battle, the everyday battle against PTSD. You will hear expert commentary from a doctor who has spent nearly the last decade leading the walking wounded to healing, one of those wounded being her own son. You'll learn what not to say to soldiers, what you can say, and what you could say once you're close enough to them. If you're like us, you wanted to help, but you just didn't know where to start. We will address specifically what pastors, church leaders, and the body of Christ can do. Support that goes beyond the soldier and reaches into the lives of their families. We will point you towards faith-based programs that you can feel good about supporting. Though you may have not been a soldier, you can be a warrior fighting for the hearts and minds of those who are too tired to fight for themselves. Let's help our veterans. Let's jump in the trenches and drag them to safety. Remember, not all wounds are visible. My name is Bobby Gray. I'm 31 years old. I'm originally from uh, Birdboro, Pennsylvania. I'm Nakia Gray. I've been married to Bobby for 10 years. We actually just celebrated our 10 year anniversary yesterday. Decided to join the military back in 2000, early 2001. The biggest driving force behind that was uh, September 11th. The emotions I was feeling then, being 18 years old in high school, I knew if that meant sacrificing my life, then that's that's part of it. That's that's what comes with it. And that's that's my duty, and that's that was my job as being a Marine. We met in May of 2005, um, about three months after he'd gotten back from Iraq. Honestly, for the first year of our marriage, we actually really didn't see each other that often. They deployed in on June 6, 2006, and um, that day was really hard for me, not knowing for sure where he was going and what he was going to be doing, and I couldn't get in touch with him any time that I wanted to. You don't, you really don't think that what you hear is true. You just kind of, okay, yeah, we're going to Iraq. That's great. And it was a very surreal feeling, but it was a very honorable feeling at the same time. I think I pretty much slept for the rest of the day. Didn't really want to think about it. Didn't want to deal with it. Um, he wanted me to move back home so that I could be surrounded by my family because we had just gotten married. I didn't really have a chance to get to know anybody on base or anything like that. My family didn't really understand what I was going through. It's weird because you would think that your family would understand you better than anybody else. My name is James W. Melvin. Uh, I'm a retired United States Air Force veteran. I spent 19 years, 10 months, about 22 days uh, in the Air Force, I start out uh, as a short order cook, work my way up, all the way to superintendent of operations. I just figure that the military would be a golden opportunity for me to be able to really travel and see a lot of the world that I know I would never, never have been able to. Uh, December 3rd, 2004 was one of the hardest days of my life, especially in the Marine Corps and life in general. Um, that day we were hit with a vehicle-borne IED, a truck bomb that uh, come driving through our, our back gate and detonated inside our walls. Um, we heard some small arms fire. Um, by the time that we were able to react, the, uh, the truck bomb had already detonated inside our inside our walls and it was just, just havoc. I mean, just fire everywhere, debris falling everywhere. Um, we were all blown out of the building and I mean, I, I, got up, I got up, I was covered in blood on my, my left side, and I thought that it was my own blood. I'm like, oh man, <laughs> this isn't good. And, you know, a, a personal inspection of myself, I realized that I was fine. There was nothing wrong with me. 
a few minutes had passed. We were trying to keep ourselves calm and, you know, just grasp what was happening, not knowing what had happened. Um, but not too far away from us where the, the truck bomb had detonated, we had a Marine, we had Marines outside the wire that were doing position improvement on the, uh, on our, on our base, our FOB, as we call it, forward operation base. Um, they were just, you know, just doing their, their duty. Um, they, they decided instead of running when they seen the truck bomb, they decided with no gear except their M16 to engage the enemy and virtually sacrificed himself for the safety of 37 other Marines. Just seeing that that, that night and just, and never had a chance to really react or grasp of what happened except just knowing that we had lost two Marines. And that was in December. We've been there since September, and that was the first time that we experienced loss of life. I'm Wendell Hedrick. I did 20 years in the United States Navy from Trinity, North Carolina. 12 years active and eight reserves. Uh, retired in 2005. I'm not sure, personally, if it was an act, the actual combat situation or fear for your life, or fear for everyone else um, that's with you or the ones at home. And it all kind of carries together. It doesn't matter if you're 19 or 49, you know, if you've got parents and friends and kids at home and you have people with you. Um, you know, I had 30 guys that were I was in charge of. And to be in a situation where you think, chemicals are coming in and you got 40 year old men crying um, with tank rounds exploding it it, it changes you and, and a lot of times you won't understand it till later I've been a counselor for over 30 years because the adrenal glands affect one's hormones for instance testosterone oftentimes when a soldier first gets home they're they're in that honeymoon period. They're very excited about being back with their spouse or their girlfriend or whatever. And they're excited about having special intimate times with them. We come home March of 2005 and it was, it was a great feeling. It was the sense of completion. I'd always kind of felt like he just had this piece missing after he had gotten out of the Marines and I noticed some changes in him shortly after. Within about two weeks, their testosterone has tanked and they don't feel the drive that they once felt. And so oftentimes they mistake that for, I'm not in love with her anymore. She's silly and needy and I just need to move out or I just need to find a girlfriend because this isn't working for me anymore. The marriages of deployed military, the divorce rate is incredibly high. It's 38% higher than the national average of divorce from our deployed military, returning home, believing that they're not in love with their spouses anymore. I'm Lena Meredith. I spent 14 years in the United States Air Force Security Forces, and I'm married to my best friend. My name is Dwayne Meredith. I served uh, 10 years active duty in the United States Air Force Security Forces and six years reserves in the United States Security Forces. Dwayne and I have a pretty much a dark sense of humor. Um, being first responders, that's how you get a really dark sense of humor because it really gets to you because stateside, we're police officers. Soon after I was medically retired, I did get uh, a job with uh, Sears in Philadelphia um, working as loss prevention, you know, apprehending bad guys who were stealing from the store. And after one such incident, uh, I had a flashback in the office. They ended up putting me on uh, administrative leave for a week while they reviewed my files and uh, reviewed everything. They ended up bringing me back, but uh, when it came time for us to move to uh, Idaho from Philadelphia, uh, they decided they weren't going to transfer me out because of incidents like that. I try really hard to fit in, um, but I don't fit in. I'm well aware of that, but I have a hard time 
making girlfriends that I connect with because we don't connect. We have a lot of not, women my age, we don't have a lot in common with each other because of what I've done, where I've been. Um, even back in church when I was active duty, I had a hard time with the other church ladies because I was never around. And when I was around, they were like, what were you doing? And I'm like, That's, I can't tell you because, you know, and then the conversation just goes out the window and I don't fit in and I have a really hard time making friends. It's something I am working on though. Um, it was July 4th weekend, 2005. We were driving up to Reading, Pennsylvania. We decided to take a long trip and go meet his family. And we had stopped right outside of Washington, D.C. to get um, some gas. It was the smell of the fuel, diesel fuel, and going back to the event in Iraq um, when we got hit by the truck bomb. That was the first time I was exposed to this, the same elements, the same smell of what had happened to us in Iraq. And that day I had completely lost control of myself at the gas station, feeling feeling like I was going to die. And I remember screaming at the wife and everyone in the parking lot to get out of here as quick as you can and felt the need to save everyone that was around me because I refused to let something bad happen to any one of us. Recently, my wife and I went to uh, a muscular dystrophy walk for a friend of ours whose sister has muscular dystrophy. It's very difficult for us to deal with crowds. Right now, terrorist organizations are driving vehicles into large crowds, and you want to participate in this, but you never shut down. And with Dwayne and I, we'll actually fan out and be <laughs> have our 360 degree security. We were constantly on, on lookout, being vigilant. Uh, I had three pistols on me at the time just in case something had happened. It's a real bummer to be out in a crowd because you're so anxious and you're so on high alert. You know, that, that triggered me a little bit because of what we had to deal with over over there in Iraq and Afghanistan. A final event becomes unpleasant real quick and it's just uncomfortable. Uh, it was it was a real tough time. It was hard to enjoy being out with friends when we're constantly being vigilant and our heads are on a swivel and we're listening and looking for everything that could be a threat. You can't really tell who the enemy is because all of them, it's hard to tell. Little children come up to you and they be padded, they be, they be loaded, they be, you know, they, they, you, you don't know, you just don't know. This is why we live in this bubble, and I hate to say we live in a bubble because it's, a lot of people don't understand PTSD or traumatic brain injury, which I have, or a seizure disorder, um, which I also have for my traumatic brain injury. And it's not as only the kids have gotten used to it, but initially when I started seizing out, if we went to like the 4th of July parade, um, they got embarrassed. And I don't want my kids to be embarrassed. Now they don't care, but, and I wasn't embarrassed. I first met my husband when I was living in Florida, and he was in the Coast Guard, and he was born on the West Coast. We were married for about 10 years, and uh, he was in the Navy for a couple of years. He went over to Japan and lived there for two years, and then he got out of the Navy, and he ended up switching over into the Coast Guard. Uh, it was when he joined the Army, he became an infantryman. We already had two little girls at that time. He was gone. He was gone a lot. And when he came back, he was only home for about three months until he got a phone call and somebody was ready to have him come back on a special team in the Army. So he was home for a short amount of time. And during that time, we felt so apart, just so distant. Uh, hardly, it took us a while just to even reconnect, uh, which was sad. I would have to say it, the biggest change was in between the deployments. I felt like I was losing him, and on my birthday, he asked me what I wanted for my birthday, and I said, of course, what any wife would say who loves her man and knows he's going to be leaving, I said, I want family pictures, and uh, that was what I got for my birthday then. That was priceless, having those family pictures done. So he had two back-to-back -back deployments in Afghanistan, and that was really hard on the family, just not being able to see him him not being able to get grounded again spiritually and with the family, that was difficult. I mean, you can be gone, if you're on a what they call a sea tour for three years, you can be gone a year and a half of that easy, just gone. Um, 
and it, it's hard, you know, it's, and kids, you know, kids, yeah, I have teenagers, but, uh, you know, and it, it's like they want things all the time, but they, they don't really want things, they just want time. And you miss, while you're gone, you miss a huge portion of their life. And while you're gone, they miss a huge portion of your life. So there, you know, my my oldest now has gaps where I wasn't even around. I wasn't even home when he was born. He was a great father. He always cared and was excited to be with our children. And he was there for every birth, all three of our children. And then the fourth child, he was deployed in Afghanistan for the first year and he missed the birth but he was radioed at the time of the event and we reached him and I was able to tell him that he had a son and that was exciting for him. He sent me roses, that was exciting for me. <laughs> the thing that I noticed first off the bat when working with veterans was that their symptoms were so completely different from civilian trauma to military trauma that was almost opposite. The civilians would often uh, be very sensitive to noise, and yet our military liked having noise around them. It meant there was life around them. And yet the civilians liked to be comforted, but the military veterans were too revved up to be comforted and they were the comforters, they were the protectors. They didn't like anybody to comfort them. There's really two different kinds of deployment when you're in the service. There's the ones you know you're gonna go on and the ones you don't. The ones you know you are gonna go on are scheduled. Um, you know ahead of time and, and you and your family, your loved ones work through almost a separation phase prior to you leaving, to be honest, so it doesn't bother you as bad when you go. And then the ones you don't know about really come as a shock to everybody, especially if you have kids or a wife and you find out, you know, you have to leave in two days and in some cases you don't even know if you're coming back. Sometimes we would get a call this time of the day, say be back to the tarmac. We had to live with a bag that was packed with three days of clothing. We had no idea where we was going. Had no idea where we was going. Sometime we would get out of the plane. We'd be in, in Jordan, over, over in Saudi Arabia or somewhere. We, they, would, they would not, I did not, I never liked that. They never told us where we was going. They just said, be back to the tarmite certain time. Certain, certain, certain time, be back here, ready to go. Go home, kiss your wife, pat the dog. Kiss everybody goodbye and, and just, you know, make it quick. Because if you drag it out, what you're gonna do is everybody's gonna get upset. And the more everybody gets upset, the more you get upset. So it's easier just emotionally on everybody just to, to go. So when you get back from a deployment and they actually give you training, you know, a lot of people think they don't, but they give you training that don't go home and run in the house and try to take over and be the king of the hill. You know, it's a transition. Like when you leave, there's a transition while you're leaving. So when you come back, there has to be a transition as well. You're in a hyper vigilant state 24 hours a day. And then you come home, you don't know how not to be in that state. So that's part of the challenge, I think, is understanding uh, that it's okay not to be that way. Now, with our military, they also may have an exaggerated startle response, but they're usually looking for their weapon because when they're in country, when they're deployed, they've always got a weapon with them. And so they're, they're patting their leg, they're looking, they're pulling over their shoulder, they're looking for a weapon. And, you know, it's best to just not notice that. If they say something about it, just smile shrug your shoulders. It's just not good to put them in the position that they need to defend their actions when it's something that's just so automatic for them. We don't recognize changes in each other because that's, that's who we were in combat. 
And when we came home, that's who we were. I recognized some changes in myself and Dwayne too, because I couldn't drive. I really had a really rough time driving in New Jersey, which is a, I mean, anybody would have a rough time driving in New Jersey, but I was having really big panic attacks because I ran a lot of missions outside the wire and with IEDs and all that stuff like that. Um, our aggression went towards each other um, because we were there together. So there wasn't anybody really seeing the changes that occurred to us or that it happened with PTSD and things like that because we were together. So it was just him and I, if that makes any sense. But everybody's so happy that you're back. So nothing else really, you know, really comes into play immediately. Um, and then with time, life, real life sets back in again. You can't, you can't go from not being in a household for six months to just showing up and everything going back to the way it was. It's going to be different anytime you leave. When I got home in 2003, I went to go visit my dad, and it was hunting season, and a shot. Um, gunshot went off and I took him down by the back of his knees and put him down to the ground as we were walking into the house and um, so the next day we're supposed to go hunting with all my cousins and my uncles and all we did was sit around the table and drink coffee we never actually left to go hunting and I knew it was because of me no one wanted to take me out in the woods with a gun my dad also was a marine he was in Korea and he also came home with some battle scars, some of the hidden wounds of war. I didn't always understand why his temper was out of control. I didn't always understand why he was overprotective, why he didn't want me to go out at night, and why he wanted to know exactly where I was and with whom. He'd seen so much, and there had been so much death around him. In December of 2007, we had made the decision to um, get out of the Marine Corps and kind of go try to live civilian life. I wanted a normal life. I wanted a normal job. I think some of the hardest part was him not having a job when he came back. That was a big major stress on him to, to find a job uh, coming back into the community. I came back and, and the job I had when I, I still had a job, but the position I had when I left was gone. They don't have the support system. That's where our churches can make a difference. That's where our communities can make a difference. They need jobs. That's why there's an $11,500 tax write-off if you hire a veteran. Please hire veterans. They need jobs. They're not dangerous. They're not going to hurt you. They need jobs, and they need to be employed right away. So I don't have a job. Um, I'm 100% disabled because of my seizure disorder, um, which, like I said, that put me into a real bad tailspin. Um, so I can't be a police officer anymore, and that was my main job stateside in the Air Force. So I went back to school full time this fall, hopefully. I'm going to go to law school and become a lawyer because I argue really well. I felt what I had. You know, my time in the Marines was over, and you know, I I set out to accomplish what I would have wanted to accomplish for this country and myself and my family. Honestly, that was really hard for both of us. I think to adjust. Your whole life revolved around them and the military and their mission and what they were doing, and that was your mission was to make sure that they were capable of carrying out their mission and to kind of you know, get thrown back into the civilian world, you don't really have that mission anymore. It's so different with a soldier or a Marine. They feel guilty being home because there are so many others that are still deployed. He talked a lot about survivor's guilt. Didn't feel that I deserved to be happy, mostly because it's not fair that I get to, I get to live and they don't. One of my thoughts with the injuries that I have is, you know, survivor's guilt of, you know, we lost people over there, we're still losing people over there. And, you know, some I had thoughts in the past of why wasn't it me? How come it had to be this other guy? How come I survived, was able to come home to my family when they were not? And I've had to write letters home to, uh, to <laughs> You know, there's, there's, I've had to write letters home to their families to, uh, you know, explain what they did with us and how honorably they served. And 
explained that their sacrifice was not in vain. Uh, it's real hard to deal with. Uh, it, it hurts every day. Um, it uh, really triggers, you know, when I have to talk about it. It's, it's a rough subject to talk about, but, you know, I think it's something that people need to understand. Oftentimes when our veterans come home, they are confused about God. They don't know if God's mad at them because of the kills that they've had. And so to continue to emphasize the love of God is the most important thing that you can do with any veteran, is to let them know that war's rough, it's tough, it's awful, but that God still loves them and that they were serving their country there have been wars from the beginning of time and that God doesn't dislike them and he's not disappointed with them because they were a part of war and that they're, they're okay, they're free, they're free. I knew I was depressed and, and kind of just, I guess, ha hateful with the world and just she knew that I wasn't the same person that I was just you know, things were getting very bad. So he struggled a lot with depression. I just kind of always felt like there was just something that was not quite right. I think the worst part for her was she knew, but I didn't care or was too reckless to care or maybe just truly didn't know that anything was wrong because I didn't see it and I thought it was the normal part of life. PTSD manifests itself in different ways. A lot of people self-medicate with alcohol. Um, other things. I wouldn't be able to sleep at night. I'd find myself, you know, sitting in a room in the dark, thinking about things and thinking, you know, sometimes to the point of paranoia. Everybody's out to get you. You know, why has all this ever happened to me? Those sorts of things. You never stop. You never shut off. You never turn off. You can hear every little thing. Um, I mean, shoot, I just sit, I'd watch my kid breathe. I could listen to her. If she start, stopped snoring, I could hear it from the other room. It's a feeling of worry about everything, constantly. Always armed, always, I mean, you don't sleep well. I can't sleep without the fan on. I mean, it's too quiet right here now for me. Um, we, I, you never stop, you never shut down. He would be his normal self around everyone else, but we would just argue over the tiniest little things. I was doing everything I could to personally destroy every relationship I had. I really had a hard time trying to, to fight for our marriage. When a person is deployed for nine months to a year, there are certain physiological things that happen to them that need to be corrected once they get home. I ask every time a new soldier comes into our office, whether they have lower back pain. And up to this point, it's nine years now, I've, I've never had one that hasn't said, yes, I do have lower back pain. And that's because your adrenal glands sit on top of your kidneys. And they're uh, about the size of a quarter, shaped like a teepee. And when our military deploy, that's the size they are. But when they return from deployment, they're often the size of a raisin because they've been under uh, a adrenaline output for so long that the adrenal glands are just tired. I could definitely see some warning signs, even over our phone conversations when he was in Afghanistan and I heard rockets in the background. So he was having a fear for his life daily. The one time I called home when we was in Kirkuk, Iraq, because I usually just sent emails, called my dad. So I was actually on the phone with my dad when explosions started happening and gunfire. And it was literally on the other side of the wall from us and people yelling and sirens going off. Oh, we started getting blown up and mortared and 249s were going off. And my dad's like, oh my God, I'm like, love you, bye. And he's hearing all of this. And as I'm hanging up the phone on him, he's screaming. So my poor old man, I feel so bad for him. I put him to the ringer. That was... Yeah. I think we all have stories like that. Yeah, it's pretty much a nightmare. When he threatened to take his life, I knew for certain things were terribly wrong. He had told me over a phone call that he was considering doing what he did. 
And I knew if I had turned him in, he would be extremely angry at me. It would, it would be very bad. For me, it would be bad because he would be angry that I actually told somebody, and if he didn't mean it, it would have just made me look horrible, like a horrible wife. I had enough fear and respect for him that I called Military One Source. However, I did not go on record with them saying that he had said those words because of the repercussions that it could have had on his job. And if he came home and knew that I was the one that reported him, that wouldn't go well. The stigma of PTSD um, is ridiculous. It makes it very, very difficult for people to get help. And as soon as you go to mental health to ask for help because you need help and you know it, they take away your gun. You're on the rubber gun list. You, everybody knows, ooh, they're suffering from problems. And that's half the reason why we never went and got help. Something should change when it comes to that policy. My wife was wanting me to get help. And I was too either too stubborn or too ignorant to see that. And that caused a lot of stress over a lot of years. The amygdalas retain negative memories and they are also the triggers that signal the adrenal glands to produce adrenaline, which will cause you to fight, flight, or freeze. One of the things that happens with our military is that those amygdalas are generally 30% larger after deployment. And so they have a harder time fighting anger. We would deal with it in different ways that were not so productive, you know, arguing and fighting. We were against each other. We were taking our aggressions and just acting out on it against each other instead of working with each other. For me, leading up to the suicide attempt, um, my family, my direct family, and, and some of my, my best friends and closest friends had no idea what I was going through. The only one that had an idea was my wife. It was very easy for him to, to seem normal to everybody on the outside. And her being the only source of comfort I had, I chose to push her away as much as she, uh, over the years, encouraged me to get help, or whether, whether it was to go to the VA or just call one of my fellow Marines I served with to even just to talk to him and open up. I finally talked him into going to the VA. I had to push him really hard to get him to actually talk to them about the things that we had going on, but he had passed all their tests and everything, so they didn't really do anything about it. So they took me off all the medication, which was great, because that stuff was terrible. You know how the VA likes to give you Skittles? I think they had put him on some medications or whatever, and um, he'd taken them for a little while and didn't like the way they made him feel. They suck. They're not fun, not fun for anybody. The one thing that he would say to me over and over again was, just stop, you're trying to make me think I'm crazy. There's nothing wrong with me. And but this look in his eyes that he had that day was like nothing I'd ever seen before. PTSD say we are not crazy. Make sure you tell <laughs> He said, be sure to tell them we are not crazy. We just uh, have a mental imbalance in our brain, and that we just need help, but we are not crazy. I ended up calling the Veterans Crisis Line. Uh, I just, I couldn't do it anymore. And I'd been, you know, doing things to try to ease my own mental thoughts and pain, uh, which a lot of people do. Asking for help is probably the hardest thing you will ever do, because you're admitting that you're weak. You know, as a, as a man and a father, and you got three kids and a job and responsibilities, you do not want to walk in somewhere and say, I need help, I can't handle this. When a veteran is deployed, there are incoming missiles all throughout the night. When they go out on missions, they're usually out for anywhere between 12 and 24 hours, sometimes days at a time. So in those cases, they are under stress constantly. When I'm driving down the road, you know, one of the side effects of PTSD is, you know, you, you have memories of roadside bombs and my truck got hit. And when I drive down the road to this day, I get very nervous, very anxious over debris on the side of the road or dead animals on the side of the road. 
Um, today, for instance, I was driving to the grocery store and there's a couple of five gallon buckets laying in the gutter on the side of the road and I veered clear across the other lanes just to get away from them. And can you imagine knowing that you have to go back out there the next day and do the same thing over again? And the next day you have to go back out and do the same thing over again. And the next day, the tours, some people spend three or four tours over there in the desert. One of the things we found with SPECT scans is that the hippocampus, which holds on to, like I said, long-term memory, long-term past memories, that hippocampus shrinks 30% while deployed. That means that all the soft memories usually go. My mind was blown because I was gone for so, so long. So, and we were already starting to fall apart with our marriage. He was not, he was not writing me like he normally, he would write me daily and he stopped writing me daily uh, through the internet, through email. Things were, things were definitely not looking good for our marriage. Uh, I could just tell he was he was separating from us, from his family, he, from his children that he normally loved and were, was very interested in. He did not even have much of an interest to be around or to know. Even when he came back, it was not it was not good. Things like your hormones, estrogen, testosterone, things like all of your happy juices, all of the things that make you feel good about your life, like serotonin, incophalin, norepinephrine, dopamine, endorphins, those glands decide whether you're going to get any of those happy hormones. If you don't have happy hormones, you're going to be depressed. And you may have a lot of anxiety. And so you may be cranky and you may feel touchy. And you may not be as patient or tolerant with your family as you once were. There's a mental imbalance with PTSD, uh, sort of like a uh, concussion, uh, and, and it don't get well overnight. I have traumatic brain injury, and it's all around the right side of my brain, and they said it's like a road rash when they're looking at it through the, um, the CAT scan or whatever it is, and seizure disorders, and they're trying to correlate the two so that we can learn more about why I have seizures because once they realize that I didn't have, um, well, I have traumatic brain injury, but they want to know how that correlates with PTSD and what triggers the seizures. During an explosion in Iraq, I had uh, concussed the front end of my brain into my skull, and there's a sharp, uh, sharp point on the inside of your skull above your eyebrow, and it had uh, essentially killed the frontal lobe of my brain. And they explained to me that that part of the brain is the filter from the brain to the mouth, among other things, some memory stuff. And, uh, you know, it's caused me some troubles with uh, being out in public and speaking. You know, I'm pretty blunt, obviously, because of it. And people don't know how to take it. And a lot of times it, uh, it can cause some troubles. My name is Jim Joyce. I'm a U.S. Army retired command sergeant major. Um, Vietnam veteran as long and, and as well as a veteran of the Gulf War in 1990-91. The room you're in right now is our wall of honor here at the Heritage Park Veterans Museum in McDonough, Georgia. What you see here is 76 pictures of fallen Georgia heroes on this wall. 77 if you look at the one picture that's in the corner on the table here. Of the people that are on the wall, the youngest is just two weeks past his 18th birthday. The oldest one is actually too much shy of his 48th birthday. Of the 76 people that you see on this wall, five of them took their own life after multiple uh, deployments overseas. I'm the only one in this building that knows who those five are, and I will never tell. The one thing, though, that really people need to know and understand is every picture up here has a family associated with them. And those families also suffered just like some of the people that were on as well. When a soldier feels helpless, they hate that feeling so badly because in every other situation, they're generally in charge. And so when they feel anger, um, it feels better to them than feeling helpless. And so sometimes they feel that anger 
Um, however, if they're covering up helplessness, then oftentimes they uh, will feel suicidal. Um, and so if you put anger with a coping as a coping strategy for helplessness, and then on top of that, you may put alcohol to feel calmer, they may try to calm themselves down with alcohol, then you've got a lethal problem because the next step is oftentimes suicidal ideas. That can be one of those permanent solutions for a temporary condition. Memorial Day 2013, um, I don't remember going to work. I don't remember a single thing from that day. My next memory was I woke up in the hospital and I remember laying there in bed and looking to my left and looking to my right and I knew that the situation I was in was serious. I couldn't move and there was nothing I could do. We had been arguing back and forth a little bit throughout the day. He went into the bedroom and a few minutes later I heard the door open to the bedroom and I heard the back door slam and so I just assumed that he was getting in his truck to go drive around and try to um, release some steam. A few minutes later I got the feeling that I needed to go check on him so I walked outside and his truck was in the driveway and I got my cell phone and I tried to call him and he wouldn't answer. <laughs> And so a few minutes later, I got a text message from him that said, I love you, I'm sorry, and I always will. My heart just sank to the floor and I knew that something was terribly wrong. They explained to me that I had attempted suicide and I told them that that's, that's not possible. That's, that's, not, that's not what happened. I heard the rustling of these leaves and I just took off running and when um, I got to, it was this big magnolia tree in the very back of our yard, um, I looked up and I saw him hanging there from an extension cord. I just screamed at the top of my lungs. I didn't know what else to do. He was so far up in the tree that even standing on my tippy toes, I couldn't touch his feet. I had no clue how he had even gotten up there. There was no ladder around or anything. I yelled at the neighbor to go get a ladder to come help cut him down, and I was on the phone with 911 by that time. I ran back over to him, and his lips were already blue. His body had already started shutting down. I checked his pulse, and he had a pretty weak pulse, but he wasn't breathing, so I started giving him CPR, and he finally gasped for breath, and um, I just stood there and held him until the paramedics got there. I was in and out of consciousness or just coherent. They had him in a medically induced coma for about a week and a half. They couldn't give us any guarantees of whether he was going to survive and if he did, what the outlook was going to be like. The longer that he went without waking up, the less likely he would have or, of surviving or making a full recovery. Up until that day, and even you know my entire life, suicide was suicide was never an option. Never, never something that as bad as anything could possibly be. That's not an answer. That's not a. That's just that's nothing that I would ever do. I didn't know if he woke up, whether he was going to hate me for saving his life, or whether he was going to be glad that I'd saved his life. My wife come walking in, and I knew, well. How's that? How's that my wife? He reached his arms out and I ran to him and hugged him and he was like, I'm so happy to see you. Waking up and they explained to me what happened. They let me get up and they walked me to a mirror and I could, I could see the mark on my throat. And I knew then that, all right, well, what, the, what they're saying was true. I'd be an absolute liar to say that I never had suicidal thoughts. Um, I'd never said that to the military when I was active duty, but I'd be totally lying. One big coping thing that we've found helps us out a lot is humor. You know, we try to find humor in everything to kind of alleviate the stress and not bottle up everything. We would joke about pretty sinister stuff just to get it out, but do it in a fun way so, you know, we're not crying and we're not reliving those moments in a horrible, horrible way. Ten days before he passed away, he went to the VA. 
The counselor assessed him as having PTSD, and he was supposed to go back, but he died the day before his appointment. I'm a PTSD survivor. My doctor, she is the only reason that I am able to stand here right now and talk to you as I look into this camera lens. You have to take time. You have to realize what you can do and can't do, and you have to go for help, and you have to, if the doctor gives you medication, you have to take it. <laughs> because historically what happens is you start feeling better and you say, I don't need this, and you stop taking it, and then you go back down the rat hole again. The children still keep his pictures in their room and they get to see his face and that helps. Also, while he was on the deployment, I had the kids each have a daddy doll, which is this cute little doll that looks like him and they sleep with them. Mom, you know what? <laughs> I won't bring any other stuffed animals, but I'll bring daddy. <laughs> and on the doll, it says something that he wanted to tell them. So for my, my daughter, it says, daddy loves you. And that's a keepsake that they'll have forever. If somebody's struggling with this stuff, you'll never know because they're not going to tell you. First of all, you have to admit that you need help. Because if you're in denial, no one can help you. And that's the hardest thing for people to do because of pride and the stigma that goes along with, you know, having some sort of condition. It's difficult because we feel so strong and your soul, are, Arr, I'm a military girl, I was combat that twice, Arr, I don't need help. It's better than taking your own life and, yeah. There's gotta be something higher that helps you out. You just can't do it yourself. I didn't like the, the stigma. I didn't like the word PTSD. I didn't, I didn't want that associated with me. He didn't want what had happened and his diagnosis to define him. I still didn't feel comfortable around friends and family because I always felt like they were just looking at me in a, in a weird, different light. Everybody was, I, I don't want to say scared of him, but I guess they didn't really know how to act around him, whether it would trigger something else to happen or just really didn't know what to say or how to deal with it. If you are feeling any kind of symptoms or what you even think is a symptom of PTSD, get some help, ask some questions, find out, because that may mean the difference between you, life and death, and the happiness and well-being is your family. Be strong, you can do it. Go ask for help. You can't tell them to get help, but if you notice something going on, maybe you try to ask them in a way that they won't see as implying that they're weak. I personally helped a friend who was expressing dark thoughts about possibly harming himself. I personally reached out to him and said, hey, listen, private message me and I'll give you my phone number so we can just talk. Biggest thing, you know, even if it's one person, two people that you can talk to, they have similar experiences to understand. Because what, what many people face is they come home and they have nobody to talk to. Regardless of the PTSD, the traumatic brain injuries, whatever it was, I felt that I had control and I was absolutely wrong. And I was still at the lowest point of my life, confused, mad, no idea how to resolve what had happened, scared that this, this may happen again. I struggled with that regardless of enrolling in the VA. When soldiers get home and they don't have a job and they are losing their house and their marriages are falling apart and their kids are screaming at them, they feel pretty helpless. Then, if they're told that this PTSD is a permanent condition, that they're never really gonna be better, that they're always going to be traumatized by dreams and nightmares, sweaty palms, anxiety, depression, poor relationships and not finding pleasure in anything they once found pleasure in. No wonder the suicide rate is at 23 a day in America, with 17 states failing to report 
whether they've had a suicide or not. If they lose hope and all they feel is helplessness, then why should they try? It was a year after his accident. He decided that he was just going to own up to what had happened and he was going to let everybody know. He was going to quit being ashamed of it. Something just come over me that this this isn't how it's supposed to be. This isn't this isn't my style of life. Here's what I believe. If it's a disorder, it can come back into order. I believe that our soldiers are not cursed with post-traumatic stress disorder the rest of their lives. I believe there's things that we can do about it. Seek help, so important. You have to be the one to go out and seek the help because it's not gonna come and find you. You have to do it yourself. Families have to be able to recognize that their loved one is having some issues, all right? And let them come and help you and get you help. But by all means, whatever you do, you have to get help. And it, 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 don't be embarrassed about getting help at all. I was able to start telling myself that PTSD is not a bad thing. And it's, you, can, you can make it a bad thing, you can make it a positive thing. When I stopped doing the things to self-medicate and I stopped causing stress in the home, then the family started to heal as I heal. I look back now and I would have made some changes. I would have definitely stepped in and got him some help. I tried calling the chaplain, but they couldn't force him to have any counseling. And thankfully a dear friend did step in and he actually did go to the vet office 10 days before he died. But at that point it was already too late for him. It's said that everybody who goes into combat finds God almost immediately. And uh, as far as, you know, how pastors could deal with veterans with these issues, you know, reach out to your congregation and get those veterans together to discuss their issues and just sit in with them and listen. As a pastor and as an evangelist, it has always been a focus of my ministry to try to bring encouragement to those who are overwhelmed by the struggles of life. And one of the passages in the Word of God that I've used many times is in the book of Corinthians where the Apostle Paul is speaking about the thought of comfort. He tells us in verse 3, Blessed be God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort, who comforteth us in all our tribulation, that we may be able to comfort them which are in any trouble by the comfort wherewith we ourselves are comforted of God. A lot of times when people go to counseling, they can give you the academic side of the counseling session, but they cannot give you the spiritual side. And there's a distinct difference in the spiritual side and the academic side, okay? Sure, you can fill in all the blanks academically, but until you can fill in the blanks spiritually, you have only halfway completed the process. Pastors, ask the newly redeployed for a cup of coffee. Ask them to, to tell you how you can get involved in helping them. Ask them to dinner. If you're a neighbor of military, ask them over for dinner. Ask them if you can take care of their children for an evening and let them go out with their spouse and just have an evening of rest with their spouse. I've had a lot of the, the Marines I served with open up to me, thanking me and talking to me about the issues. And that point is when I really felt inside that it was okay, because I was still very intimidated and scared to, to talk about what I was happened. You know, they don't even see their brothers in arms that deployed with them for generally 90 days after deployment. And there's nothing like a soldier that can read a soldier. They need to be seeing each other soon, sooner. Department of Defense, they need to be seeing each other sooner. I know you want to give them a break, but they need to be looking each other in the eyes. They can tell if they're not doing okay. You know, you're not the only one because that's, that's just, you don't think anyone's dealing with it, but everybody is. People who have been in combat and been in war and have had to deal with that stuff, they deal with it daily and, you know, it really, you know, affects 
not just them. The biggest thing somebody can do is make yourself available to listen in compassion without pity. You just need to sit down and, yeah, brother, I love you, I care about you, and I want to listen to you, just talk to me. You'd be surprised what they would do to somebody sometimes. He had some, so many great characteristics that he taught me. He taught me a whole lot. And when he was with his family, uh, he loved us. Uh, he loved what he did. So when he was working, he put his whole heart into it. There's 22 military suicides a day. That's, that's one every 65 minutes. And um, m veteran military suicides... Um, the death rate from that, the death toll from that is higher than the Iraq and Afghanistan wars combined. It's one day at a time. You know, it's being thankful every morning that you're on one side of the, the ground and the sun came up and, you know, focusing on that day or short-term goals, not looking at something a month, three months, six months from now you can't control. What I would do differently is just get more involved in the person's life. If you know that they're falling away and you're feeling the separation from them, reach out, reach out to them. There is a way to make them come back. There is, I, ha I know there is. So I have hope for those that are actually experiencing the, the depression and the, the post-traumatic stress. I have hope that they can come out of it and it doesn't have to end the way it did for my, my soldier. As a word of encouragement to other pastors, we will encounter all sorts of people in our congregations who have great needs. Many times the struggles and the problems are so complex, but yet we have the greatest answer that we can give today, and that is found in God's Word. May I encourage you today, encourage those who are broken, help those who are wounded, and let them know the love of Jesus Christ in their life. It's a serious, serious issue and if you get help, you can survive and make your way through it. Believe me, I know. I'm there, I've been there, I am there, and I will be there in the future. But get some help. You need to be honest with them. Uh, when, when I do counseling, one of the things I tell folks, I'm gonna be brutally honest with you. But a lot of people don't want the truth. They don't want the truth. And there ain't but so much that you can tell them without telling them the truth. You see, I, I don't think anything that you shouldn't ask because they need, they need to see themselves for what they are not, but for, but for, but for what they can become. Uh, just because you're in a mess now don't mean you have to stay that way. I hate to say it, but a lot of civilians don't understand it. And being a military person, when you don't even understand it, what's happening, it can, it's really bad and it can be really taxing on relationships. I love you. I love too. In 2009, our only child deployed. It was a horrible deployment. So many were lost during that deployment. So many tragic things happened. And tragic things happened to our son. I'd like to say that because he had a wonderful childhood, and he did, that he came home and everything was just fine, but it wasn't fine, and we weren't fine. There was a depth of pain that I can't even express. It was absolutely horrible. Coping strategies that weren't working that nearly killed him. There were suicide attempts, there were depressive times that all of us experience that we just thought we couldn't take another breath or put another foot in front of the other. We got help. I want you to know this does work and that what is out of order absolutely can come back into order. Please don't give up. Please don't hurt yourself. Please don't take your life. Your life can be 
wonderful again. Our son's life is wonderful again. He's married. He's happy. They own a home. They love their lives. They love their work. But there were dark, dark days. I can't tell you that there weren't days that we fell on our faces screaming out to God. Please trust that your lives will be back again. Trust God. Granted, I, I wouldn't want to go through what I've went through, but I still, I still love this country. I don't, I don't blame our government. I don't blame the Iraq War, Afghanistan War for, for anything that myself, my wife, my family has been through to this day. It's still, besides getting married, it's still the single most biggest accomplishment was to serve this country, and I will love this country till the day I die. On the behalf of Zach and Rodney Ministries, we are grateful for you watching Soldier's Kiss. Dr. Calloway and those interviewed have shared the symptoms of PTSD. Some of these symptoms include having difficulty sleeping, self-medication, anger, being overprotective, and even survivor's guilt, marital trouble, and even threatening to take their own life. You've heard real life stories about how the impact of war goes much deeper than we realize. The soldiers have explained how the stigma of being associated with PTSD makes it very tough to ask for help. If you feel like your spouse or family member may need some help, don't talk yourself out of it. Don't wait. Take them seriously. There may be consequences for reporting it, but the consequences of ignoring it are far greater. Do your best to ask them to get help in a way that doesn't imply that they are weak. We challenge each church to have at least one person trained to help those suffering with PTSD. Be sure to add them to your prayer list. Make sure you tell them God's not mad at them. He's not disappointed in them for serving their country. Take them out to dinner, have a cup of coffee. Watch their kids so they can have a date night. At the very least, make sure your church has a support system for the soldiers when they come back home. Now, if you're a soldier and you're wondering, could I potentially be struggling with PTSD? The soldiers in this documentary are encouraging you to get help, citing the dangers of waiting. So call that helpline, reach out to the VA, tell your spouse, reach out to a fellow soldier or maybe a pastor. But whatever you do, get some help. Do it for you, do it for your family, do it for your children. It'll make a difference. And maybe perhaps you may encourage another soldier to do the same. And remember, as you heal, so will your family begin to heal. Now, if you're a civilian and you've never served in the military, remember that there are things that you can say to a soldier and things that you shouldn't say. If they've been in combat, don't ask them about how many kills they've had. If they wanna talk about things, they will. But you can ask them certain things like, so what would you want civilians to know about returning soldiers? What would you want us to know about you and how can we best support you? Maybe perhaps instead of just saying, thank you for your service, you can say thank you for standing in my place. And in light of your service for our country, what can we do to support you and your family? Now, if you're an employer, one of the most helpful things that you can do is to hire a veteran right away. One of the most difficult things for them is when they return is finding a job. But by employing them very quickly, that relieves a lot of pressure from the home. Perhaps after watching this documentary, you've been inspired to do more. And sometimes it's difficult to find organizations that you feel comfortable about supporting. But there's one that we can encourage you to support uh, that we believe in. It's called Together for Vets, and that's the number four. Together for Vets, Dr. Luann Calloway is a part of that nonprofit organization. 
They are making a tremendous impact and making a difference to support our troops. That's one that you can count on. So now here we are, the conclusion of our documentary, Soldiers Kissed. As you talk to these soldiers, listen, be there for them. If one of them ever wants a, a hug, make sure that you give it to them. Show compassion without pity. For additional resources, visit facebook.com soldierskissmovie or you can reach out to us at zachandrodneyministries.com.